This episode of The Minimalist is brought to you by nobody, because advertisements suck. The Minimalists. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus, and together we are The Minimalists. Today, we're going to talk about lifestyle clutter. We're going to talk about all the extra things we do and the extraneous activities, obligations, and tasks we commit to that make our lives more complicated. And so why not have Ben Greenfield here to do that? Our returning champion is here. (laughs) That's right. I live a very uncomplicated, uncluttered life. So (laughs) you picked a perfect guest. (laughs) Well, I I tell you what, um, I'll I'll tell you, on the surface, Ben, your life does seem to be cluttered. If I were just to look at your surface, a lot of obligations, a lot of things you do, you're very productive. But I think that you live an intentional life, if not a minimal life even, because the things that you do, when we talk about minimalism, what we're really talking about is the intentional use of our resources. Part of that's our money, but then our time, our attention, our energy, and you use all of those things intentionally. You might use them differently from how Ryan and I were use them, would use them, but you, you use your resources in a way that adds value to your life, mm-hmm. as opposed to being you know, passive and, and just constantly you know, pacifying yourself with, with distraction. Actions, mm-hmm. and so um, I you've want obviously to... never seen me around a pile of ribeye steaks because I can get distracted <laughs> for a few hours. <laughs> I would call it focused. No. <laughs> well, well, we're here on the there occasion. Are certain things that can derail me. <laughs> uh, we're, we're here on the occasion of your new book that came out, Boundless. It is. Uh, I have our books on top of yours, and my God, this is like. Ryan, I need your, yeah, need your help picking it. this up for, yeah. to show it on it, YouTube. That, I feel that, like that book is anti-minimalist. <laughs> my apologies, gentlemen. You, I broke all of your rules. You know what? I just we just decluttered a bunch of books in my household, and that's we kept that one because it's uh it's like a fitness bible almost. That's what you should have called it, the fitness. Well, bible. it actually <laughs> is in a way decluttering because you no longer need ten books. You've just got one. Absolutely, you, know, you don't need your immunity book or your fat loss book or your muscle gain book, etc. Yeah, just, it is a large all in that one. Large, when it showed up. You I just gave me a brand new sales pitch. <laughs> <laughs> when it showed up on the doorstep, the uh, the UPS person dropped it and it made a very large sound. I thought it was an earthquake for a moment. I, I was thinking about this book. I, I was going through it. By the way, sorry to interrupt. There was an earthquake last night. Yeah. 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 I, I thought I was just feeling things. My bed was, <laughs> the hotel was cleaning the, the carpets late at night or something like that. And, you know, I forgot I was in California. Yeah. I was just in a I woke up stupor. To my, I woke up to my wife. She was like, what are you doing over there? I'm like, nothing. I think it's an earthquake. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm like, they gave me the vibrating bed and I randomly figured out how to turn it on at 4.30 a.m. What are you doing over there? Go back to sleep, honey. <laughs> you, you know, I uh, I was up writing uh, and um, I was editing this book we're working on and I, I had just finished this really profound line. All of a sudden, the earth started shaking. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I think I got it right mm-hmm. finally. That sounds about right. Um, <laughs> ben, I was thinking about this book, uh, Boundless. If I were to rename it, not that I would because I think it has a phenomenal title, but I, I, I think of it as just how to live. We have a, a friend, uh, Derek Silvers, who has this new book that's coming out called How to Live. So um, no it's, it, it's a phenomenal mm-hmm. title, but th- there's something in here for just about everyone. If you have a yeah. question about life health i mean the we'll we'll talk a bit about the book itself in a little bit but the subtitle here is upgrade your brain optimize your body and defy aging so Mm, you you, it's really mind body spirit as well right well originally i wanted to write a book about anti-aging and longevity you know what the so-called blue zones are doing where all these people are living a disproportionately long period of time uh you know drinking tannin and polyphenol and flavanol rich teas and kombuchas and beverages and herding goats and climbing mountains and being with people and getting lots of sunshine and you know what what's their diet comprised of you know largely a you know lower carb mediterranean approach in many of these places with with legume intake and a wide variety of plants and herbs and spices and you know how how they're training how they're moving how they're lifting uh, the problem is, though, once I started to go down all the different biological pathways to aging, it turns out you got to include some stuff on immunity. You need to include some information on the gut, on on the, the blood-brain barrier, mm. on neurotransmitter balance, on the type of muscle fiber composition that lends itself best to living a long time and being functional. Mm. And it kind of turned into more of a manual for the body and the brain. 
And uh, there was so much that I kept coming across from gratitude, belief in a higher power, prayer, relationship, silence, solitude, meditation that Mm -hmm. was also woven into the lifestyle practices of so many healthy people Mm -hmm. that the spiritual component just kept coming up over and over again. Mm -hmm. And so multiple chapters have have that part as well, which, which is honestly... I think one of the more neglected components, especially in physical culture, mm-hmm. you know, th- this idea that you have this, you know, invisible spark inside of you that, that you must fuel and feed by sitting cross-legged with your eyes closed, you know, in a fasted state, speaking to God or, or praying or focusing on your breath work. A lot of people don't want to hear that, that they just need to slow down and stop and take a breath. Right. But there's, there's a lot of that woven into the book as well. So yeah, it took on a life of its own, but originally I just wanted to be about anti aging and longevity i feel like you can you can this is one of those books you can read it all the way through or you can use it as the, this sort of encyclopedia for living better mm-hmm. in a way and so speaking of living better we do want to talk about lifestyle clutter today this is a listener driven show so we'll dive into some questions we have here from the audience let's start with amber in atlanta georgia how do you let go of limiting beliefs i'm an aspiring artist and as josh may know that means i've been drawing pretty infrequently lately I have this belief I must make a profit from my art, and it's stopped me dead in my tracks. But worst of all, it's kept me from feeling happy in my everyday life. How do you minimize your inner critic? Now, Ben, I think this is fascinating because we often conflate sort of creativity with needing to make a profit right away, but sometimes that actually spoils it. It, it does. It, look, the, the most satisfied and fulfilled that you will feel in life is if you're living out your life's true purpose, right? We're all born with a unique skill set. And uh, I think that everyone should have some kind of single succinct purpose statement, the mm-hmm. thing that gets you out of bed in the morning, you know, what the Japanese would call ikigai, uh, or in Italy, it would be called the plan de vida. But this idea that you know, why it is that you are here and what your unique purpose is, you know, both of my children have purpose statements, one is to create art that elicits powerful emotions from people, right? Mm-hmm. That's, that's his purpose statement. Um, mine is to, uh, to read, write, learn, teach, sing, speak, compete, and create in full presence and selfless love to the glory of God. And, and that's my purpose. That's what rips me out of bed in the morning. One very important component of your purpose statement is once you have found it, once you have formed it, And you do this by thinking about the things that you really enjoyed to do when you were a kid, the things that make time go by very quickly for you now, put you in the so-called zone, uh, the unique skills that you have that allow things to come easy to you. And and when you've identified all of those things, you, you can piece together a purpose statement based on what it is that you're actually naturally good at and feel a great deal of joy from when you're engaged in that. But if you hone your purpose statement down, you have the perfect purpose statement, and then you go forth into the world, and your goal with that purpose statement is Maslow's hierarchy. Right? I'm, I'm going to use this purpose statement to get my house, to feed myself and my family, to make a lot of money, to get a better car, have a bigger home, etc. That That's pretty unfulfilling versus this idea that you think – I have my purpose statement. I'm going to go out and love as many other people as possible with mm. that purpose statement, mm. right? And I've even couched that into my own statement. You don't have to do that, but you know, in, in full presence and selfless love for others is is kind of tailed at the end of my purpose statement because I want that constant reminder. Mm. But you find your purpose statement, and then you go out into the world and you love other people with that purpose statement. So, uh, so uh, Amber was, is is the is the yeah, gal yes. called in? Yeah, she. If she creates art and she has an avatar, she has that person in mind who's going to be seeing her art and being moved, being emoted, having some kind of a connection to her art, some kind of inspiration. You know, what what is the end goal of what her art is going to do mm-hmm. for people? I guarantee that if you are creating your business around a service for other people and loving other people, the money will come. If you come at it from the other angle, I, I want to do this to make money, you'll often get disconnected from your true self. You'll hold yourself back from creating what you actually want to create because you will experience what one of the more common regrets of the dying is, living your life, creating or doing what the world expects you or what you think mm. the world expects you to do versus staying true to your authentic self. Stay true to your authentic self, 
love other people with your purpose and the money will come. Yeah. There's this thought of, you know, Ryan and I will sometimes say that good businesses make money, great businesses make a difference. And right now, Amber is striving through this thought process because she's been acculturated to believe that I have to make money first. It's the primary driver of doing what I'm going to do. Well, you're striving for at best a good business, but a great business, as you said, it helps all helps other people solve their problems. Now, it can you can do that through art, you can do that through writing, you can do it through plumbing, right? There, there are different ways to solve people's problems. I loved your purpose statement because there was nothing that even hinted toward earning more revenue or maximizing cash flow or right. anything reach, like that. Reach one billion customers in ten years. Like I, I don't think those are those are bad objectives to be on a on a business blueprint, for yeah. example, or even a, as part of the the core purpose of a business. Um, you know, having having some kind of metrics that you want to reach. I think that's smart. But in terms of the value that you want to deliver, it it really should be. For other people, yeah. the the other thing that's important for a creator, for an artist like Amber, is to realize that it's okay to outsource a lot of the business and the financial decisions and the delivery and the publishing and the shipping to a team, thus equipping and enabling you and freeing you to create. And I've, I've personally found that as I add team members to my team and I'm able to just focus on the writing and not think, okay, who's processing the credit card if someone wants to go buy a book from this article I wrote and you know who's monitoring whatever Instagram advertisements for this product that I have in my mind that I want to create if I free myself from that by surrounding me with other people who do a lot of the business and the financial stuff it allows me to go into creator mode and not have those little thoughts ticking away at the back of my mind as I'm trying to create, I'm trying to write, as Amber is trying to make art. And so that's a big part of it too, is, is you want to outsource some of this stuff to a team who can do some of that thinking for you. And mm -hmm. in an era of virtual assistants and you know mechanical Turks, I think they're called nowadays it, it's a it's, it's a term used to describe you know people who do things for you on the internet it, okay. it's pretty easy scalable and cost effective to find people who can do things like your landing page your credit card pro you know all, yeah. all of that is pretty achievable in this day and age i like i like the advice to yeah focus on creating it it sounds to me like you're saying focus on creating more and maybe on the results less even though I mean, we should care about the results, but if you're just focusing on the results, it's going to stunt your creation. What I like about your uh, your purpose, Ben, is it's it's very lasered, but it's also in a way very broad mm. because you can, in many ways, uh, fulfill that purpose. It doesn't mean that you have to be a an author who gives great advice on health. Uh, there are many things that you can do to fulfill that purpose. So I, that would be something I would recommend is when someone is coming up with this this purpose statement. It doesn't have to be like, oh, I have to be an artist to make money. Uh, keep it as broad as possible. The, the the statement could be, I want to create work that is going to inspire others or move people emotionally. And uh, yeah, I, I think that'll help take a little bit of the pressure off from from Amber here. Ryan, I, the, the, there's the thing about when we're talking about clutter here, because what I hear in her question even, and Ben, you tell me what, what you think about this, but really what you're talking about is taking some of these obligations that she doesn't look forward to. You're just talking about taking those off the table. And, and maybe at first you don't have the ability to do that. You know, everyone who starts off as an entrepreneur or a solopreneur, you might have to do everything on your own for a while, just like mm -hmm. Ryan and I did when we started The Minimalists a decade ago. It was literally just the two of us. <laughs> you remember going to bookstores and like measuring... The margins. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we literally did everything. <laughs> yeah. um, and we were driving around in his Toyota Corolla from bookstore to bookstore. Yeah. We would do events, you know, selling our book. And, and so, right. like, sometimes, but eventually, you'll, you'll get to a point where in order to add value to people's lives, you have to take some of that clutter away. Mm -hmm. You do, and and I do not want to paint this all as you know roses and sunshine and unicorn farts. Like like there's some hard work that has to be done. I experienced the same thing when I was a personal trainer. You know, working ten to twelve hour days with clients in a gym. Ooh. You know, counting reps and running people up the stairs, and wow. you know, and, and demonstrating push ups and squats. I would get home typically around nine or ten p.m. Mm. I would have a quick dinner with my wife, and then I would be up until about two a.m programming my website, creating PHP scripts, creating the, the credit card processing forms, doing the Adobe InDesign work on my self-published books. And I was sleeping about four to five hours a night for a wow. good three years mm. to lay the foundation. 
there are probably things that I was doing then that even then I could have outsourced, but there, there is there there is a time when you are going to find yourself working a little bit more than you would like to in order to lay the foundation for you to then say you know have enough money set aside to bring on your first virtual assistant or to outsource your first project but yeah. you know again 99 design squarespace and you know, all these websites that make it pretty achievable to do it at a low cost dictates that yeah. you know you're not going to have to moonlight for the next decade but yeah there there may be a few months or even a couple of years where you at you know life gets gets tough and, yeah. and and i can tell you that most successful people have had to put in the hard work mm -hmm. and you know for for me in the fitness industry that's one of the most annoying things when you see some kid pop up on instagram with a nice body and this you know crappy little pdf that they made for the workouts that that, that they did and, you know they're they're on hormones or andro or steroids or, or whatnot and they've got everything photoshopped they they have almost zero certifications or degrees or an, you know an online moonlit you know personal training certification and you know all of a sudden they've got 300,000 followers and they're and they're filthy stinking rich mm -hmm. even though they never really put in that much of the hard work there there's some of those people out there yeah um, but I think ultimately in the long run, um, it, it, society kind of filters out who actually knows their stuff and who gets results versus who's just a pretty face. Who's, who's a flash in the pan. Yeah. yeah. By the way, if, if you are completely careless like that and you sell someone a PDF for $20, they're not going to come back to you. You're not going right. to, you, you've lost all the trust with them. And so right. part of that purpose statement can actually have something to do with establishing, establishing trust with people so that you know, you're adding so much value to their mm -hmm. lives that they're eager to pay you in some ways. And we do that with, with our yeah. Patreon. Yeah. Um, you know, a large portion of our audience listens to the podcast for free, but then there are you know, five or 6,000 people who l listen on Patreon and they give us the opportunity to, to pay Sean, pay Jordan, pay oh, Jess. Yeah. And, uh, value, value. So when I write an article, you'll often find at the end of my articles on my website, there are opportunities to purchase things. Like, mm -hmm. I hope you enjoyed this article. If you want more, you know, grab my book because there's, there's, you know, 18 other tips on this same topic of, say, fat loss in my book. Or, you know, I've now, now that I've taught you all about, you know, curcumin or, or, or turmeric, here's the opportunity to actually grab a product that I created that will help your, your joints or something like that. However, whenever I'm writing an article or creating a piece like that, my goal is for someone to walk away from having read that a better person, a more educated person. I want their lives to be better whether or not they purchase anything at all. Same with my podcast. Yeah. All I want to do is help people. If there are things in there, you know, go to the show notes and grab this from Amazon and it supports the podcast or, you know, buy this supplement or grab this book, fine. But the goal is to deliver value and to educate. That That's always at the top of the totem pole. And if people want to buy stuff based on that, great but the number one priority to, is to create value and if you yeah. get that backwards you're not just screwing other people you're screwing yourself because right. Right. If, if you're not if you're not serving those people then well if, if they don't feel served they don't feel compelled to right. you yeah. know, to stick around oh yeah we see this in in even you know internet marketing you know long video sales letters or um or pitches for products etc the best ones have a great deal of education built in. If, if you read them, they'll always start by explaining, 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 and there's this molecule and that molecule, or you know this technique or that technique or this approach or that approach. And then at the very end or towards the end, that's when they say, "And here's a solution that ties together all these things." You know, and there, there's there's even you know people who sell products online with a with an exact script, an exact sequence. You know, first you lay down the value here, and then you explain some of the components of your product. Then you have the testimonials, etc. But all the best ones start with educate the customer, give them mad value. Yeah. yeah. What do you think about uh, suggesting Amber kind of shift her reward? So right now her reward is making money. So instead of having that as the goal, yeah, it should be to yeah move people with her art or uh, maybe, yeah, I don't know, just something that isn't so driven uh, by this specific result because I feel like when we do that, you go from like getting to do something to having to do something. Because mm -hmm. right now, if we can wave the magic wand and like give her, okay, we'll pay you, you know, a dollar for every single piece of art you put out. I mean, that's just going to make her do something over and over again because she's expecting that dollar. Mm -hmm. But 
instead of getting the yeah the the get to do it. It's it, now I have to do it to to get this dollar yeah, for each and, piece and, of work. And the result of that can be pretty much the complete opposite of what Ryan Holiday dictates in his book, the perennial bestseller. You wind up creating. You know, let's say for me as an author, I could pump out five to seven dollar PDFs and cheap Kindle books on Amazon all day long. And I, and I could profit heavily from that. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, you know, thinking forward as, 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 uh, as dark as it may seem to my deathbed, I don't see myself being incredibly fulfilled, you know, with seven, six pack abs, you know, 50 page downloadable PDFs on Amazon or something right. like that. Mm -hmm. I want to write something that is that that's big that's epic that's going to stick that people come back and return to over and over again and again if you're caught up in the money making part of things you can as you've just alluded to ryan you, you can you can create these whatever one dollar pieces of art and sell them all day long and make a profit but i think that creating true art creating masterpieces is far more fulfilling yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah. And so that's another thing to bear in mind is that with profit as the primary incentive, you'll often create slightly more shallow, less meaningful mm. products just so you can get them out there, ship and pay the bills. Yeah. Well, the opposite of a, a shallow product for sure is this uh, Boundless book. Amber, I'm going to send you a copy. Actually, I'll send you this copy. Maybe we'll even get Ben to sign it for you, sign Amber. It. I'll devalue <laughs> it so you cannot eBay it. And, uh, and there you go. Let me ask you. Um, how 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 big was this book before the editing started? Was it like twice as twice as much? Like, did you have to cut a lot I, the, to get the it? The manuscript this? that I turned into the publisher was twelve hundred pages. That Woo! was that was three years of working with uh, wow. a couple of research assistants, a scientific editor, uh, the the publishing company's editorial team. And uh, so we cut about 600 pages because okay. the, the current version is 650 pages. Okay. However, I didn't want to kiss my babies goodbye. So I put all the extra content that I got cut from the book onto kind of a hidden resources section of awesome. the website for the book. And so when people get the book, they can go and put in their little Amazon order number or their order number and get access to all of the hidden content. But that, that was tough because the way I write books is I generally have a, a shared cloud drive in Google and then a separate folder for each chapter of the book with all the research, all the references, the podcast, the audiobooks, the people I want to interview, the ideas I have. There's a separate folder in that main Google Drive for each separate chapter of the book. And so it winds up turning into a, a little bit of a beast over time, but at the same time, as you revise, you have the previous revision. This paragraph got cut, but we've got you know the very first version of the chapter that was written. Mm -hmm. And so for me, kissing my babies goodbye wasn't as painful because I knew they'd, they'd live on. They, you know, they're not in the actual published manuscript, but they're still online. So that kind of freed me up a little bit to, yeah. to have a little less pain yeah. about the editing process. That's Amber, great. enjoy your copy of Boundless. we got a question from Yosef in New York City. I'm a senior in high school and um, ending the, the course of my, my career at high school. Uh, I have a lot of time. I'm just figuring out what I want to do with my life and, and everything that I'm going forward. So just wondering if you have any suggestions to find meaning and purpose. And, and now that I have this clean state and going to college, well, what I should really be heading for. All right, Ben. So Yosef here, he has a different kind of clutter. He has the the too many options clutter, you know, the paradox of choice. He's graduating high school. Congratulations for asking this question right now, by yeah. the way. Not waiting until you were 30 like me and Ryan to start <laughs> asking this question. Yeah. And and you know, instead, we just sort of let the winds of consumerism and the business world push us in a particular direction. But you're asking this question now, how do, how do I be more intentional? How do I figure out my meaning and purpose? Hmm. Well, we we fortunately touched a little bit on this in replying to Amber's question, but to get more specific about your purpose, I mentioned thinking back to what you liked to do when you were a kid. Yeah. That's you. What did I like to do? I like to read. I like to write. I like to learn. I like to teach things to other kids in the neighborhood, like how to burn ant piles with a magnifying glass or forage for plants. I was very into the outdoors. Uh, I loved to compete. I liked to create things. I loved to sing. And uh, in about adolescence, I really got into speaking on stage, everything mm -hmm. from speech and debate team to, you know, talent nights to, to, uh, to singing on stage, et cetera. And so all of those things that I enjoyed to do when I was a kid, I've woven into my purpose statements. That's one thing. Sit down and make a list, Yosef, of all the things that you liked to do when you were a kid. Mm -hmm. okay, that's step one. 
Also, write down a list of things that make time go by very quickly for you now. Mm. If you put me in front of a blank page on a word processor and give me a topic to write on, I will happily start typing away, you know, no no writer's block, anything like that. And if you just sit me in front of that computer at, at 10 a.m., I'll write until 1 p.m. and feel as though 20 minutes has passed by, yeah. you know, and, and I'll have to set up a reminder, you know, do your jumping jack, stop for your Pomodoro breaks, you know, do your, do your little eye stretches, et cetera, or else I will just sit there and burn my eyeballs out mm. writing. You set my wife in front of the same blank page and she will be weeping within like 10 minutes because she <laughs> hates to write. And uh, at the same time, if you give her a canvas and a paintbrush and some oils, she will paint and paint and paint like nobody's business and create wonderful art and it just flows from her. Whereas for me, I would sit there and, and be throwing the paintbrush out the window and, and making a complete mess on that canvas because I just, uh, you know, that's not something that puts me into the zone, mm -hmm. art, right? And so if you identify the things that make time go by very quickly for you now, you make another list of that. And you'll find that some of those things overlap with what you like to do when you were a kid. You take both of those lists and from there you begin to hone down your purpose statement. You'll find that there can be a little bit of guilt because this idea of self-actualization dictates that work feels like play to people who are self-actualized. Like time goes by very quickly. Things come easy to you and you don't have to feel guilty about that. Right? We, we have this idea, you know, perhaps inspired by the old school puritanical or, or um, you know, this, this work ethic, that work must be blood and sweat and tears. And as I've alluded to earlier, there are times in your life when you really will feel like in order to, to pay the bills, you got to put in a little bit of extra work or even have a, have a job on the side. But your, your, your main career, the thing that you decide to do based on how your purpose statement evolves is often something that feels like play yeah. that comes easy to you. And it's okay. Give yourself permission. If, if you just excel at, you know, let, let's just pull some random thing out there at, at a studio processing on a computer with music and creating amazing tunes with whatever, a guitar and a synthesized piano and, and a microphone, you, you wanna start making music and, and jingles and songs and, and that just comes super easy to you and you've always loved music, you know, growing up and it comes easy to you now and makes time go by quickly, then, then you know, start creating Udemy courses online and start creating music that you can, you can put on Spotify and, you know, start an Instagram channel and, and you choose the things that come easy easy to you. You pair that with the things that make time go by quickly, what you enjoyed to do when you were a little kid. And that's a really good way to start to piece together why it is that you're here, what your unique skill set is, and what your true purpose is in life. And then like I mentioned earlier, go out and figure out how to help as many people as possible, love as many people as possible with that purpose statement. Absolutely. I want to recommend to Yosef, uh, I want to give him permission to like not have it figured out right now, because it sounds like he's just putting a lot of pressure on himself. And be curious, like it's okay to be curious and not have it figured out. You're 18 years old. The biggest piece of advice I'll give Yosef to uh, enable him to be able to be curious and to not have it figured out, avoid debt. <laughs> you're 18 years old. You're going to be getting credit card offers. Uh, he talked about going to college. Um, yeah, just try to try to avoid debt as much as possible because that will free you up to to, to have some time to figure it out. Including debt well, for college. I, 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 right, yeah. I, I think you can leverage debt wisely. I mean, if, if you get a 0% oh, zero, zero on, on, a, on a credit card and you, you get a, you get a mm, great no, extension. I'm, I'm going to... I, I am not a Dave Ramsey cash is king guy. There well, are, I, will, I, will well, leverage, I will leverage debt to the hilt no, I mean, if, it'll, yeah, if it allows me to accelerate growth. Well, well, here, here, let, let here's what I'll say. There, there are some debts that are better than other debts. Like, mm -hmm. that is absolutely true. Like, you're not going to encourage him to go get a payday loan. No. Uh, so, so, I mean, I, I think we can agree on that point. Um, but, but, yeah, I mean, as far as, far as uh, debt in general... Um, if he owes somebody something, it's he's going to be forced into having to do something rather than getting to do something. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, fundamentally, I believe there's no such thing as good debt. So mm -hmm. uh, personal debt, at least we can we can talk about business debt or government debt. Those are two different conversations. But in terms of, of personal debt, uh, especially for someone who's in his, this situation where they are going to heap six figures worth of potential debt on you. 
you know, they're, you're borrowing against your, your future here and you're not even sure what you want to do, quite often people will go into five, six figures worth of debt. A great book on this by Anthony O'Neill called Debt-Free Degree uh, shows you all the ways that you can mm-hmm. graduate the same degree that you want to get without any debt at all and gives you tons of examples on, on how to do it. I think, Ben, where we will agree is if you can get by through a situation without debt, it's better. T- oh, if you can not get by without debt, debt right. absolutely. Yeah. And there are forms of debt that I do frown. You know, uh, university-based tuition debt. I, I think that's that's horrific. I've been thinking in the in the medical system, it creates a bunch of doctors who are overworking, seeing patients for fifteen minutes, trying to pay off their bills for eight years, yeah. and really producing bad medical care as a result of a, a broken educational system yeah. for physicians. You know, that that's one example of debt creating a horrific scenario. The same could be said for, you know, many other university programs where students finish and aren't able to live out their true purpose because they're simply just racked to the hilt with debt. And they, they you know, and, and again, it's yeah. a Maslow's hierarchy scenario, you know, panic, yeah. fear, make money, figure out how to pay this off versus living out one's true purpose. Yeah. And I think that's what we're trying to tell Yosef here is don't get yourself in a situation like that. Right. Yeah. Yosef, I'm going to send you a copy of our book, Everything That Remains. It's my favorite thing that we've we've ever created uh, in terms of our books. And it's really the story of Ryan and I leaving the corporate world in massive amounts of debt. Mm-hmm. And it's part of my, my big aversion to it is I made really good money in the corporate world. I spent even better money <laughs> on really stupid stuff. Mm-hmm. And and so I had massive amounts of debt. I was made good money, but it was broke. And so we, we sort of talk about the whole process that Ryan and I went through over that five year period of not just decluttering, but get our getting our priorities straight and also figuring out what direction in which we wanted to travel. And Yosef, I think that's the direction that you're going right now is you're just trying to figure out what direction do I want to travel? One last thing that I'll tell you is that you might figure out your purpose right now, and that purpose can change over time. Hopefully, you've got six or seven decades ahead of you right now, right? Mm-hmm. So you could have six or seven different purposes that you master over a lifetime, but occasionally we pivot. You know, Someone might be a, a recording artist in their 30s, and they become a producer in their 40s. And, and so uh, I hope you enjoy that book. It's called Everything That Remains. Uh, if you like our podcast, I'll send you the audio book version, or if you want the book book or the ebook version, we're happy to send those to you as well. Yeah, that, that's, that's, again, just just super quick, one really important thing that you just highlighted is the purpose statement can change, right? Two years ago, mm. mine was to empower people to live a more adventurous, joyful, and fulfilling life. And I was steeped in adventure sports and endurance racing and just wanted that. I wanted that ability to be able to inspire people and empower people through the adventures that I was having and realized a couple of years ago, I'm not going to be a professional athlete forever. I'm not going to be out, you know, climbing mountains forever. And something kind of needed to shift. You know, the next chapter in the book that is my life was approaching. And as that happens, your purpose in life can change. Some of the same skill sets and purposes that come naturally to you can still be woven into that purpose statement. But I recommend that you sit down and revisit your purpose statement at least every year yeah. and uh, give yourself the permission that it might change as your interests change and as opportunities arise. And, and, you know, life is a mysterious path full of zigs and zags to the top of the mountain. And, you know, you have to be open sometimes to changing your purpose statement or, or turning to the next chapter in life. Absolutely. Otherwise, yeah, you're going to, you're going to feel stuck. Uh, one other thing, uh, figure out what your values are. Mm. Uh, we have a, a free worksheet on our website, the minimalists.com slash V there's an essay there called How to Understand Your Values. And you can just print out that worksheet. We, we have identi- we've identi- identified four different types of values. So your foundational values, your core values, your service values, and the most dangerous values, your imaginary values. Yeah. The things we pretend are important but actually aren't. Theminimalists.com slash V for that free worksheet. Ryan, what time is it? It's time for our lightning round where we answer your text messages. You can text your questions and comments to 937-202-4654. If you send a text message to that, you also get our Monday morning minimal maxims. We'll send you a text to your phone every Monday. We'll never send you spam or junk or That's advertisements. pretty good alliteration there. Monday Monday, Monday morning, <laughs> what did you say? Minimal <laughs> maxims. Monday minimal morning. maxims. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so... Uh, Speaking of minimal maxims, this is where we do our best to answer questions with a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. I don't know if you remember this, Ben, but um, we put the text to these minimal maxims in the show notes so people can uh, copy and share our pithy answers on social media if they'd like. Also, they can find all of our minimal maxims in one place now. In other words, maxims.com. Make your answer tweetable. 
Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But yeah. you can ramble on and like Sean will uh, fix it up in post. Yeah. Uh, we'll, so <laughs> we'll just talk a bit and then hopefully we'll find something profound. Yeah. Or not. All right. We got a question here from Zoe. How do we let go of long term commitments and obligations, especially the things we typically enjoy, but we're just burnt out on? So long term, uh, long term commitments and obligations, things that we've committed to, yeah. right? Here, I'll just give my pithy answer and then maybe Ben can expand. Everything you've picked up, you can put down. I think we don't realize that. All of a sudden, we're traveling up Mount Everest with uh, 150 pounds worth of gear on our back. Mm -hmm. And it's, we picked it all up one ounce at a time too, right? And not realizing like, oh man, I've got so much. And this weight can be literal. You can have a lot of stuff, but there can be all of these other weights too, the obligations and commitments that uh, Zoe's talking about here. Yes. Uh, Anthony DeMello in his book, Awareness, sums it up quite nicely when he says that we should be able to look at anything in life that we derive pleasure from and say to that object, that item, that person, that thing, that activity, I derive pleasure from you, but I am not attached to you for my happiness. I do not yeah. depend upon you for my happiness. If there's anything in your life that you can't say that to without feeling a little pit in your stomach and, and a little bit of resistance to saying that, then that is something that has become an unhealthy attachment yeah. or a pleasure that you're actually relying upon for your happiness. So I would read Anthony DeMello's book, Awareness. Very quick read, simple mm -hmm. to get through, but it really teaches you how to release a lot of those attachments, how to release a lot of those pleasures. And I've found that that for me, in terms of cleaning up the clutter, that a big part of it, a big part of that clutter is related to what another author, Napoleon Hill, dictates in his book, Outwitting the Devil. Mm -hmm. Outwitting the Devil describes this so-called hypnotic trance, right? These rituals, these habits, these routines that we set up for ourselves that we become very addicted to throughout the day. You know, we have this dopaminergic response to, you know, I've got my stretch routine, you know, in fitness, you know, I got my stretch routine, I got my breath routine, I got this workout, I got that workout. Oh, I just found out about the sauna, so now I gotta do the sauna. And, uh, oh, somebody's talking about cold thermogenesis, so I need to figure out how to throw that. In the and by the end of the day, there's all these things to do, mm -hmm. right? But you can get drawn into it as just like this hypnotic trance of rituals and routines and habits. And you need to be able to step back and identify those things that you're just doing because they've become a habit that you feel like you have to do yeah. versus those things that are actually necessary and crucial for you to feel really fulfilled at the end of the day. And you'd be surprised at how few things there are that are actually truly necessary versus those things that become mildly addictive habits. Yeah. You know, this question makes me think about what you were talking about earlier with, uh, examining our purpose and being willing to change that. I think the same thing goes with our commitments. Maybe, you know, on a yearly basis, you look down and look at all your commitments and ask yourself which ones are worth keeping and which ones might have to go, which, what you might have to change. My pithy answer is this, a meaningful life overflows with joy, not commitments. So when I think about that, uh, when I was reading this question, I also thought about how a commitment should ultimately lead you to something joyful. You know, if uh, I know there are certain commitments in life that, you know, we've got to go to work and pay the bills, but ultimately that is leading to something joyful. But if you've committed to something that is uh, completely non-joyful, um, I give you permission to let it go. So, hmm. all right, before we get into our listener tips and our added value segment today, both of which I think you're going to enjoy. But before we get into that, uh, in fact, I want to talk to you. You had this thing about the news, Ryan. Oh, yeah. So we're going to get it. The Do bad news. Well, I've got the good news about the bad news mm. or the bad, the good news on the good news about <laughs> the bad news. We're going to get to that. It's our added value segment. But first, we got a bunch of surprise questions like, what are your thoughts on healing practices like Reiki, acupuncture, and hypnosis? What other non-traditional practices might you recommend? What daily rituals make Ben feel at peace? What makes him feel the most alive? How do you prioritize what matters most? How do you avoid negative self-talk? How do our boundaries help limit our mental and emotional clutter? Also, we're going to discuss parenting, uh, homeschooling versus unschooling. We're going to talk about Ben's most useful gadgets. 
uh, a lot of things that he uses intentionally to amplify or enhance or improve his life. We're also going to talk about some of the sex tips that he has in his book, Boundless, but he goes way beyond what he talks about in the book. Uh, we're going to have him talk about a lot of things on the Maximal episode, plus a bunch more questions for Ben Greenfield. And if you want to hear all that, check out our Maximal episode this week on the Minimalist Private Podcast. Guys, it's a completely separate endeavor. And it's just two bucks. It's a totally separate podcast. And it's the best way for us to fund this podcast. It's the most honest way for the minimalists to earn an income. You know, we don't do advertisements. We think advertisements suck. So we make money if and only if you find value in and support what we create. Just head on over to theminimalists.com slash support to subscribe. You'll also get a personal link so that our private podcast plays in your favorite podcast app. Ryan, what else you got for us this week? Here are some voicemail comments and tips from our listeners. Check them out. Hi, my name is Katie from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I was really close with my grandma who passed away probably about 12 years ago, and I ended up with a lot of her jewelry because that was what I played with as a kid. And as I've gone through my minimizing journey, I've decided to keep one thing, and it's her class ring from 1948. I wear it every day. In fact, that's too small now. I can't even take it off. And everything else I have let go, and that way I can always keep her with me. However, I don't have the burden of all of her other jewelry. Hi, my name is Adrian, and I'm from Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, you guys were talking about meditation and how it could possibly lead you to a dark place if you have never done that before, and you spent like maybe a long time in meditation, and I just have a lot of insight into that. I just wanted to share that, yes, it could bring yourself to a dark place. However, for me personally, I was able to uncover a lot of traumatic events that I've suppressed since childhood through meditation. And although that led me to a very dark place initially, it led me to where I am now, which is a much happier version of myself. Um, so I just wanted to share that for listeners who may be turned off by that idea. Um, I think that it is worth it so, to meditate. All right, y'all. Thanks again to Ben Greenfield for joining us today. Check out his new book, Boundless. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. We'll also put a link to his podcast, Ben Greenfield Fitness. And for our added value this week, Ryan, you came in here today, this morning, before we started recording. Yeah. And you were like, I read this headline, just messed up my day. Messed up my morning, man. I, sh- I should have, <laughs> I usually check news later in the day. I don't know why I checked it this morning. Uh-huh. But yeah, I read a headline. Uh, it totally threw me off. I had to come in here seeking some advice from friends to help me get over this headline. <laughs> and I think the problem isn't the news per se. It's the news media and mm-hmm. what the media is doing. In fact, because the news, we won't have to talk about it because it's a rather partisan thing. Yeah. And, but... What, what's happening is they're actually reporting on non-news most of the time. Right. The, the news that you came in with was pure speculation. Right. From and by the way, what we did is we went to like the most conservative organ and we went to the most liberal organ, and they were both reporting on the same news, right? Yeah. The but the same non-news, the mm-hmm. same speculation. And so my knee-jerk reaction is, well, let's just ignore the news. Right. And okay, that might be better than than constantly being bombarded by the news, but I think I have something better. So my added value today is a quarterly journal called American Affairs, and it's a policy journal, and they do a really good jo- job writing long-form essays Interesting about policies. I love that. And by the way, it's usually, it, and it mixes both sides. I mean, we always look for like, well, I want the conservative take and the liberal take. They actually take very thoughtful pieces from all sides of the political spectrum. Conservative commentators, centrist commentators, um, liberal commentators, and they get deep into nuance on policy. So I've learned a whole lot more about policy Mm. on a state level, on a national level, on international policy. Mm. I've become educated instead of being beaten by the fire hose of news. And so I love it. I would encourage you to get a subscription to American Affairs. I'll send you the link to it. We'll put a link to it in the show notes as well. It's a quarterly journal. It shows up. It's printed. It's it's a little bit bigger than one of our books. This is everything that remains here. But it comes and it's it feels like a book every time I I get it, Mm. and it it reads with all of these different essays, and they're they're thick. They're probably two hundred pages. Wow. But I go through and and what's beautiful about it, the cover lists every essay that's in 
in that particular one. So I'll just go through and say, oh, wow, that one about California's tax policy and how we got here, that one looks really interesting. It's about the the potential feudal state of, of California, or there was another one about you know, environmentalism or, or whatever, but they really get into the nuances. This sounds like really boring news, uh-huh. but in fact, isn't that the important news? Exactly. And the problem is, is we look for non-boring news, which is the least important of what we should be reading. And these are well-written. Yeah. The stuff that you're reading we don't even care about the the writing anymore, right? Yeah, no. And, and we don't care about the nuanced point of view. And, and it actually takes these long-form essays to be able to, to dive into the pros and the cons mm-hmm. and for people to be able to, to steel man their own arguments. You yeah. can't do that in a headline or even a 400 word op-ed these are much more intelligent much more of a deep dive on important topics and yes it may not be as sensational but they're so much more satisfying it's eating that meal where you feel nerd you you feel nourished by the end of it not the piece of cake that they threw at your face this morning what a great analogy yeah Yeah. because because after eating that cake i feel like crap right ruins my morning (laughs) i shouldn't have eaten cake this morning so check out american affairs and real quick for right here right now here's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalist we have a free ebook for you it's called financial freedom it'll help you get together a, a sort of budgeting plan but it's the five steps that ryan and i took so that we could become debt free and financially free and we put it all into one ebook and we're giving it to you for free no strings attached you don't have to give us a dollar later or anything mm. uh it, it's just uh, the minimalists.com slash resources it's on our resources page you can download it from there the minimalists.com slash resources the free ebook is called financial freedom you can follow the minimalists on facebook twitter and instagram at the minimalists Come to one of our live podcast shows. Visit theminimalists.com slash tour to find a city near you. If you have a question, comment, or minimalism tip for our podcast, email a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. You can comment on this episode at youtube.com slash theminimalists. And if you want our show notes in your inbox, sign up for our email list over at theminimalists.com. You'll also receive our simple Sunday emails. And if you leave here today with just one message, we hope it's this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it